string of figures winds rapidly through the air and scrub, kicking up dust clouds of, uh, from the red powdery soil. The sun is rising to the height of its heat, and soon the open semi-desert will be no place for any living thing. Despite their dark skins and the protective covering of hair over their heads and backs, the socials will not be able to tolerate the shriveling temperatures of midday. That is no problem, since at their speed, the string will reach home before the conditions become too bad. The spine of the string consists of about 30 youngsters, each carrying his or her allocated load of roots and tubers and woven bags. Moving parallel to them on both sides are about a dozen mature males, their sensitive eyes and ears scanning the red and gray landscape of potential enemies, their elbows bent and their huge bladed hands dangling in front of them, ready for the defense of the string. At the tail end of the string, two of the young gatherers are carrying a living creature between them. It is somewhat like one of the socials, but smaller, and does not have the long legs that allow the string to move so quickly. The two socials that carry it have their interlocked their arms to form a kind of seat, and on this creature, this the creature perches with its arms around the necks of its supports. They greet this creature with care. It is their seeker. Without the, a seeker, the semi-desert would not yield up its two ubers and roots, and its water deposits remain hidden. Socials would use up their energy at, and time, roaming the vast wastes in random attempts to find new food supplies. The seekers, although they are not part of the social's family and lead their own lives within the home, are a valuable part of the community. The string master pauses. There's something not quite right about the landscape ahead of them. He barks a single word about the whole, and the whole string stops instinctively. They all drop down behind the scrubby bushes to become invisible, but the, the cloud of their dust remains over their heads like a flag. It is another gathering string, one from another community, encroaching on neighboring gathering land. With a few quietly grunted words, the string master commands the young gatherers into a tight huddle, surrounded by about half of the fighting males, while the rest of the males spread out in a defensive arc facing the interlopers. They need not have trouble with the stealth. The interlopers know they are there and are approaching in a determined advance, eschewing any cover. The string master views the approach in dismay. There's, this is no gathering string that has lost its way. It is a band of warrior males, without a juvenile gatherer or seeker amongst them. No further need for camouflage. The string master barks orders that jab his own warriors into action. Up they leap from their cover and flail onto the oncoming party. Instantly, the string master sees that his own fighters are outnumbered about three to one, so he calls forward those that are guarding the gatherers and their burden. As for himself, he steps back out of the way of the fighting. He is too valuable to wa be wasted in the thick of the bloodshed. They are still outnumbered, but they fight on, kicking out with their elongated hands and feet, hacking downwards and sideways with the cutting blades of their hands, poking and gouging with their long fingers. The grisly hand blades, originally designed to cut grass, can now shear through flesh and smash bone, and these are the main weapons of both sides. Severed limbs and heads lie in the dust, still pumping blood, as the defenders are forced to, to the back, of, to, back to the knot of the helpless gatherers. The last warrior to fall is the string master himself. He is happy to give his life in defense of the string, less happy that it has been in vain and the string is lost. His last regret is that he will now never have a chance to mate with the mother. After the defending warriors, the gatherers are easily slaughtered. Since there is nothing left of the original string with the seeker, who stands unmoved by the carnage, carnage, the interloper's string master addresses it and agrees to lead them to its own home. After all, it is a seeker. Seekers obey socials, whatever their home. The attacking string master dispatches two of his warriors back to their own home to summon young gatherers take back the booty warriors do not carry. He assigns about a third of his men to guard where it lies. Then he organizes the remainder of, into a raiding string and has the seeker lead them towards the home of their enemies. The string must move quickly since the seeker cannot run as fast as the socials and that cannot be now carry. Warriors do not carry. Towards the blaze of the noon, the bulk of the home appears on the horizon. From a distance, it would be unnoticeable. All that can be seen are, is a pair of ventilation chimneys that look just like the solid pointed towers of the beautiful and sacred insects that inhabit the region. The home itself is in a hollow, an impenetrable fortress. Smooth walls with no hand or footholds, red, red and hard as bone, curve upwards, enclosing the entire colony in an impregnable dome, the shape of a tuber. Only the two tall chimneys at the top break the symmetry. At the top, a crack in the structure is being repaired by a small group of gatherers, moist red clay being kneaded and pressed into the damaged area. In this vast structure are the mother, the infants, the juvenile gatherers, the female nurses, and an unknown number of male warriors, old male drones, a ghetto of seekers, and, most important for the raiders, the food stores that would sustain them all. The raiding string master, having hidden his warriors and crept as close as he dares, peers over the rise of the land and not far from the home. It is as well guarded as his own. Each of the lit ground level entrances is guarded by several warriors, and most likely many more warriors are housed in chambers close to the entrances. Breaking in is going to be difficult. 
The vague stirrings of an idea occur to him. He often has ideas. Even when it was a mere, he was a mere gatherer, he did. But it was difficult to work on them then, when everything that he did was prescribed, regimented, and expected of him. Likewise, when he had grown to be to a warrior and his female siblings had gone to be nurses, those ideas came to him. Only in the heat of battle, when an individual could act on his own initiative for the good of the home, could any of them come to fruition. Most of the, the time, the events shows that his ideas have been justified. That is why he is now a string master. This idea, however, is something quite novel. Well, disturbingly so. Southly, he makes his way back to his warriors and the captured Seeker. With much difficulty through the few words they possess, he gives the Seeker his instructions. The Seeker is puzzled. It takes a long time to convince himself of what is required, as this is something new to him as well. Eventually, he seems to understand and goes off towards the home. The Guardian warriors at one of the entrances start into attentiveness as they see the lone Seeker scrambling down the dusty slope towards them. They demand to know what he is doing. Dutifully, the Seeker states that the string is under attack, not far away, in the direction from which he has come. When asked for more details, however, he is blocked. He is not told to report anything more. As these warriors ask him questions, he becomes more and more confused. The answers he should give are in conflict with the statement he was told to make. He was given orders by socials. Now he's being asked questions by socials that would confuse the first orders. He throws his arms over his head and collapses to the ground. He cannot understand what is happening. Nor can the defending warriors. What they have understood is that the report of one of their strings is under attack. They rouse the other warriors of, ho of the home and form themselves into a fighting string, running out in the direction indicating by the gibbering seeker. Once they have gone and things are quiet, the raiding string master brings his warrior stealthily from the other direction to the abandoned entrance. He picks up the cowering sinker, seeker and shakes him back into attention. Then, preceded by the seeker, the raiding party enters the home. There are still warriors in the chamber behind the entrance, but these are soon silenced, and the raiders make their way into the interior. Pushing the unhappy seeker before them, the string master and his warriors penetrate deeper and deeper into the home. The air becomes heavier and stuffier. This is to be expected, as the females grow to be nurses and, in a few instances, mothers. They spend their time deep in the airless tunnels and chambers. Their metabolism slows, allowing them to consume less air and less food, and they devote their lives to feeding mother and the infants. Seeker dodges out of the passage into a side chamber, illuminated by a dusty shaft of light slanting through a hole in the outside wall. A great commotion ri arises. This is the part of the Seeker's own quarters, a rambling, disorganized muddle of chambers and passages within the walls of the home. A place of chaos and random life where these low creatures mate and play at will, fed and cleansed by the constantly by the home's nurses. Seekers, despite their disgusting habits and lifestyles, are essential to the life of the home. The dark, bobbing shapes of his companions welcome him back, but they are then thrown into consternation by the appearance of the strange warriors behind them. A nurse, bringing the Seekers their daily ration of food, is shocked into immobility and stares stupidly at the raiders. A bowl of chewed roots and flattened insects falls from her long hands. They kill her immediately and believe the Seekers alone. The captured Seeker now has, has now collapsed in terror and confusion amongst his companions and will obviously be of no further use. The String Master and his men push onwards and downwards, feeling their way in the darkness now. Occasionally they come across the so soft, slow body of a new nurse, or the active one of a juvenile, and these they kill without hesitation. Those that are nimble enough to escape are ignored. The raiders are after more important prey. Eventually, in the dimly lit chamber beneath one of the ventilation chimneys, they find her, enormous and reclining, fat with obesity and pregnancy, her hairless skin over folds of fat glistening dimly in the gloom, the mother. Around her move a dozen pale nurses, carrying in food and taking away waste. Slow drones, their weapon hands hanging long and unused by their sides, stare stupidly at the intrusion, all cluster around the mother in a vain attempt at protection. The raiders move in. The nurses put up no fight at all, but the drones, remembering their glorious ways as days as warriors, make a token struggle and, are pe and perish. At last, the prize is won. In the di dimness, the mother pathetically tries to pull her great bulk away on her stunted legs and wizened arms. She lets out a plaintive wail as the raiders fall upon her, and she dies under their hacking hands. Not long afterwards, the mother's body hangs head down from the partly repaired crack on the outer wall of the home. The string master stands in triumph above it. All the fighting is done now. The returning strings of defending warriors, those that have been lured away from the home by false information, are totally demoralized by the sight. The tightly coordinated groups break up and scatter, and the individuals wander off into the arid landscape, inevitably to die. Home is the string masters now. Normally he would send messages to their own home, and they would return with gatherers who would strip the captured place bare and carry all the food and seekers back to their own home, thus expanding their hunting territory. This time, however, he is going to do something different. The whole incident has been different so far. 
There has never been a home won over by using deceit, a totally alien concept amongst the socials. Their language is simple, but it has always allowed for individuals to express themselves, for string masters to communicate orders to warriors and seekers, and for gatherers to describe the whereabouts of food supplies and their dimensions. This is the first time that their language has been deluded in a deliberate way to deceive. It is indeed a new and useful development, showing great promise for the future. The other difference in this campaign is that this home is not going to be destroyed. There will still be young nurses cowering in the tunnels and warrens below, one of which will make the new mother. The other nurses and the few ja juvenile gatherers that are left will naturally be loyal to her, and his warriors will remain loyal to him, or he hopes they will, will until he can raise new ones of his own. He will send deceitful word of his former home to his former home that his own strength ing has been wiped out, so that he will not be missed. For the first time, a new home will be established, not by a mating pair cast out of a single home, but by uniting two strong homes, drawing on the strengths of each. The working of metals had been a forgotten art, but then it was remembered and forbidden. The making of boats had likewise been forgotten and then remembered and had likewise been forbidden. Now those who have dared to practice these skills are dispossessed. The boats they made carry them to safety, away from the anger of the remainder of their people. The boats are sturdily built, of planks cut by metal tools and pinned together with wooden pegs. Someday they will be able to build them of metal, if this is permitted. For now, the five boats are carrying thir 43 individuals that represent the only group of beings in the world with the courage to use the remembered knowledge of their ancestors. The woven sails bulge with a wind that they know will carry them to the islands in the warmer regions of the globe. It is not that they lack the conscience and moral terror of the rest of their people, just that they feel strong enough to overcome any danger. They know, deep inside of them, that the knowledge of their ancestors gained generation by generation eventually destroyed them. They know that their ancestors made things, they took power from the sun and sea, from the ancient concentrated remains of life, from the breakdown of the very horses that held, forces that held matter to forget her. With this power, they took metals, food, and other materials from the solid earth and from the living creatures that existed on it. They were able to increase their lifespans, eradicate diseases and accidents that held populations in check, and spread over the whole surface of the earth. Eventually, the earth had become too crowded and burdened to carry them, and they perished under the weight of their own technical cleverness. All this they remembered, although they hardly understood it, by the inherited memory of the loss of everything that their ancestors had achieved was enough to forbid the use of any of the inherited memory of the mean means of achieving it. All abided by this, except for the boat builders, who continually flouted their their people's taboo on using their ancestors' knowledge and were persecuted for it. They fought back with blades, but the overwhelming hostility had driven them away from their fertile homeland. Now they are on the wrong, but it may not be for long. Many of their boats have been left behind, and it seems likely that the more zealous of their enemies will come in pursuit. Although boat building is forbidden, sailing them may not be, and everybody shares the memory of how to sail. What is more, their choices choice of destination has been made on the basis of inherited memory. Their pursuer is using the same mix of ideas, inspiration, and basic knowledge, knowledge that the inherited memory entails, but comes to the same conclusions. There is no such thing as secrecy now. After many days of steady winds, the fugitives see the first of the islands. It is as they expect. The first sign is a cloud on the horizon. Blue hills appear next, then the green of a lowland vegetation, and finally the white streak of beach. All is predicted, except for the bubbles. Several shining, bouncing globes are moving up the beach. The puzzlement is that they produce in the boat boat is short-lived, however, as the boats are caught in the rising swell of the shallowing sea. The waves that have, that have pulsed unnoticed across the open ocean are now funneled and magnified as the seabed shallows, Ellos, bu building up into steep walls of green water that curl over and crash into an oblivion of sparkling white spray and surge, hissing up the hot, sandy beach. In this turmoil, the boats have heaved upwards, dive into the hollows, and are flung towards the land. As the prows crunch into the beach, the boat builders jump out, splashing ankle-deep in foam and sand, and drag their vessels to safety. Then, when all are safely ashore, they collapse onto the beach in joy and exhaustion. Although the voyage had been, was completely predictable because of their common memory, they had been very uneasy during their days at sea. That was not their environment at all. One of their females notices it first, the huge translucent sphere beneath a sagging palm tree at the head of the beach. They'd all seen the bubbles from the sea, but had ignored them, them and then forgotten them. It was always the way the inherited memory was more powerful than that developed by the individual. In size, the sphere could be encompassed by the outstretched arms of three people. It was shiny with a greenish tinge, and its base was spread and flattened by its own weight. Its outer covering seems flexible, and the whole thing wobbles as it rolls slowly down the beach towards them. Sand adheres to its outside as it moves, but dries and drops away very quickly. 
The female who first saw it stands and watches it roll right up to her. All watch to see what happens next. Inherited memory cannot guide them now. Before there is a time for a reaction, a silvery arm shoots out from the side of the sphere, seizes her hand, and tugs it inside. Then it starts rolling towards the water's edge, dragging the surprised female with it. When she realizes what is happening, she begins to scream, but she and the sphere disappear beneath the surf before anyone can do anything about it. The travelers stare after her stupidly, then several more of the spheres appear at the head of the beach. They do not seem intent on attack, they roll towards the sea, avoiding the party. Anger, an emotion not often felt by the boat builders, surges to the surface, like one of the bursting waves, as, and as they launch themselves in a revenge attack at the nearest sphere, surprise surrounded the sphere cannot move but it seems to waver this way and that to try and break free its surface is yielding yielding but too tough to be penetrable blows and punches are absorbed and bounce right back then one of the boat builders brings a blade from the boat and plunges it into the glistening surface the sphere bursts and a rush of salty water gushes over the attackers and sinks into the dry sand the punctured surfaces collapse into slimy gel releasing seawater in the middle of the stain lies a strange creature gasping like them, it has black skin, but the skin is completely smooth and hairless. The head is like that of a fish, with big eyes that not seem to be functioning in air. The mouth is huge and gaping. No neck separates the bulbous head from the streamlined body. Gills on the chest flap and ineffectively, and the body narrows to a paddle tail. It is the arms, however, that are most remarkable. They are human arms, complete with hands and fingers. The thing flaps it out on the beach pathetically as it slowly dies of suffocation. The sea creature has devised some means of coming onto land and bringing its own environment with it. If these islands are now the domain of these creatures, is it going to be difficult to settle here? For they have been proven to be, to be undeniably hostile. Moreover, what will happen when the boat builder's pursuers arrive? The leader starts from his sleep because his carrier is uttering grunts of alarm. Dawn is almost here, and the sun is already shining on the highest of snow-clad peaks of the range, although the, the valleys are still in deep purple shadow. Now, the mountain birds have set up on their set up their calling, and short grass beneath him is damp with dew. This fine pelt keeps him from the chill. What has disturbed his carrier? He unwinds his long limbs from around his female and rises to his spindly legs in the cold half-light. Most of the rest of the clan, hunters and carriers, are asleep. You can see the hunters huddling in pairs or with children on their slope. The huge, white, shaggy forms of the carriers are more visible, forming a loose defensive circle around the group. His own carrier, who he thinks of as Oyo, is awake and alert, disturbed by something that he cannot see. Could it be one of the distant creatures from the far lowlands? It's not really likely, since they rarely come this far up in the mountains, particularly at this time of the year. Nor is it likely to be one of the big birds. They did not attack so early in the morning. On all fours, his usual posture, the leader trots around the group to check that all is well, and realizes that he is not the only one awake. At the far side of the circle, two hunters are mating with gentle noises. He looks around and, true enough, their carriers are mating too. A rougher exercise accompanied by hoarse grunts. Certainly nothing is amiss here. He scrambles over to where his carrier stands, a white, silent, dutiful column. Without a word, he scrambles up the fur and onto its back, resting his narrow chin upon its usual spot in the, on the broad cranium. The massive, shaggy arms come up and clutch him firmly. Now he can communicate by thought, without clumsy language. With thought, he commands the great Oyo to turn slowly so that he can see the lightning landscape. He does not realize it, but this is far the landscape from his ancestors. The hunters and the tundra dwellers first came together on the chill wastelands, bordering the retreating northern ice cap. The tundra dwellers were adapted to the cold, and their great bodies could generate enough heat to keep the slim-limbed hunters warm. The hunters, for their part, were nimble enough to catch the most evasive of food, and to catch enough to feed both of them. Together, they made up more than the sum of each. There is no ice cap left now, and no tundra, and nowhere in the lowlands are there any environments that suit them. The forests and woodlands are more suited to different humanoid creatures altogether. Only in a few places on the chilly peaks and in cool mountain valleys are conditions still right. In these isolated places, the symbiont aunts linger, marooned as cooler conditions withdrew up the mountains and towards the pole where they disappeared. Nevertheless, there's still good living in the mountains. Plenty of small mammals and birds for the hunters to hunt for themselves and share with their carriers. Plenty of grasses, mosses, and lichens for the carriers to scrape up and share with their hunters. Hunters and carriers mate at the same time, the mating of a pair of hunters inducing mating in their respective carriers, and vice versa. This usually results in the birth of a hunter baby at the same time as a carrier baby. Both babies are carried by the parent carriers for about six years, at the end of which the young hunters choose their own carrier of the same age and same sex. The family groups move with the seasons, from the grassy slopes of the valleys in the winter from, and spring, to the flower-strewn bluffs and crags of the peaks in the summer of autumn. 
The habitable areas, although productive, are few and scattered, and the tribes of symbionts have had their own range. Down the brightening slope, with the gray mist of the valley behind it, stands a stranger. That is what has disturbed Oyo, the massive shape of a carrier and the squat hummock of a hunter lying over its shoulders and heads. With a burst of thought, the leader asks if Oyo if it recognizes the newcomer, but the dim-witted reply is inconclusive. Direct questions like this between hunter and carrier rarely yield anything useful. The stranger strides purposely up the hill towards them. It is a challenge. Evidently, this is a rogue male, thrown out of a clan, possibly even thrown out of the leader's own clan at some time in the past. Wherever it came from, its intentions are now clear. With the thin yells yells and reedy shouts, strange noises to be coming from the huge bulk of a symbiont, the newcomer utters its threat and challenges. The leader replies in a like voice. The result is ritual. The hunters pull themselves back from the great hands of their carriers and hang on tightly with their own hands to the long fur of the shoulders and back. This frees the carrier's arms for combat. Then, spurred on by the hunters' thoughts, the great carriers that bear them wade into each other, striking, slapping, and pushing with the flats of their vast hands. Most of the blows land harmlessly on the great areas of muscle and fur on the chest and forearms. An occasional blow that lands on the face brings blood from the nose or lip but does no serious damage. The sparring will continue until one of the combatants, usually the attacker, tires and turns away, or else falls over, separating Hunter from Carrier. On this occasion, the combat is quite predictable. Although the carrier, attacker's Carrier is big, bigger than Oyo, in fact, the Hunter does not have the mental skills to guide its blows and punches to best effect. If, by chance, he did become leader of the clan, its future would not look good. Mental skills are needed by a leader in order to judge the timing of fruiting of food plants and to plan the routes of migration. This time, however, the men leader's mental agility is not proving to be enough to counteract the strength of the attack. Oyo is cringing in pain from the bruises and cuts from the blows at which the opponent's carrier is hammering down with particular ferocity. The sharpness of the pain and fear is picked up by the leader through the same nerves and ganglions along which he gave Oyo his orders. It is no good! He's going to have to step down. Oyo will die if this continues. So after all these years, he must relinquish the leadership of the clan. He had not anticipated anything like this. Yesterday, he was at the height of, power, of his powers and virility. Now he must give way to a younger symbiont. He will live out his days as an old, revered clan member, nothing else. He steps back and turns around, presenting his naked back to his opponent. The age-old sign of surrender. The clan belongs now to the attacker. What happens then is totally unexpected and quite against any tradition. The opponent's carrier seizes him by the exposed neck and shoulder with its huge hands. Strange thoughts and immersions burst through him from contact with his enemy. Thoughts of rage and hate and uncontrolled violence from the carrier, unchecked by the feeble commands of the controlling hunter. The leader is torn, f torn free from Oyo's fur and flung onto the ground. The flood of alien thoughts ceases as do the sensations of pain and panic from Oyo. It is just as well. The attacking carrier brings down its great hands on Oyo's back and shoulders, flinging the deer creature to the ground, and wrenches back its head, breaking its neck. The silence that follows is not the s just the silence of the horrified clan, who have been roused in their sleep and are watching the fight earnestly, nor is it the silence of the hillside, produced when the birds are quieted by the violence of alarming events. It is the aching silence of loneliness. Oyo is gone. Half of the leader's clan's being is dead, and the other half must soon follow. He can no longer be part of the clan, but must seek out a life of his own and exist as best he can. This is always a failure. A hunter without a carrier, like a carrier without a hunter, is always dead within a few days. Yet cutting through the searing grief is an even more troubling thought. The clan, his clan, is now in the charge of a symbiont that consists of a powerful, violent carrier that cannot be controlled by its hunter. The hunter, as well as being weak, does not have the mental versatility to lead a clan. That much is evident during the fight. It is not just the, his own death and that of Oyo that he mourns, but the death of the entire clan and his family. There is no more food growing here. It has all been cleared out. The ravaged soil has scraggy shoots sticking out of it. It will be a long time before these grow and bear anything worth eating. Dead tree trunks stand gaunt, gaunt and stripped. Harsh, splintery wood. Killed by greed. No, not by greed. By necessity. The leaves had to be taken to feed the aquatics, but now the trek from the sea to, to the food is becoming longer and longer. Gloob peers through the watery film and gelatinous envelope over his eyes. The work is dangerous and unpleasant, but the days of easy and pleasant life disappeared long before his birth. It is said that once the sea, their home, supplied all their needs, but then their numbers became too many, then all the food was gone. Famine raged. Whole populations perished and sank into the dark depths. Sometime after famine, the fish, krill, and plankton returned, but this food source was never enough. As soon as it came back, it was exploited and destroyed once more. Nothing can be done about it. If they want to survive, they have to eat. If they eat, they lose what they have and die. 
And as if there can never be a balance, they live here, there, but they intrude on the natural system of things, and nothing that they will do will ever make it any better. Now they are exploiting the land as well, thanks to the algal mats that they have developed. Filamentless algae is a is a forming a fine mesh, impervious to water but permeable to air, and can be induced to make shapes that will hold water. An aquatic can ascend from the ocean into the harsh sunlight and thin air above, still immersed in seawater, but contained in a flexible, gelatinous envelope of algae filaments. Air passing through the envelope keeps the water aerated, and the aquatic neither desiccates nor suffocates as long as the envelope holds. Progress has been considerable. When the technique was first developed, the envelope had to be spherical, holding a vast quantity of water. This adventurous aquatic the adventurous aquatic moved along in this, rolling the squashy sphere around him, a cumbersome process. Now Gloob cannot remember now, and Gloob cannot remember when it was otherwise, the envelope is form-fitting. Only the thinnest of water layers surrounds him and protects him from the harsh world of the outside. Movement is still difficult, though, and will always be. He feels his own weight and unknown cessation in his natural home, and he must pull his elongated body along the ground with his arms. If he is carrying something, he must wriggle along as best he can. Then he has to take care of air that the jagged, denuded ground does not rip the envelope. No, this is not natural. It has been good enough, though, to allow the aquatics to exploit all the lands that border the ocean. They sweep them clean of any growing or living thing, and do not give anything time to regrow. The teeming populations below the waves cannot wait. In the distance, glimpsed hazily through the algal membrane, loom shapes that could be trees, or they could just as well be naked rocks. Aquatics had no color vision built into them when they were engineered, and none had evolved since. He cannot communicate with his companions, but he hopes that his action will be clear. He humps his long body in its glistening envelope in the direction of the shapes. The three others that are like him turn and follow. The fourth, the one encased in the spherical bubble that looks like one of the originals, is guided along by them. It is he who will unfold and carry any food they find. They are traveling up a slope, which is not good. The system to see is one thing, but height above its surface is another matter altogether. The aquatics live happily with the pressures experienced in the top layers of the ocean, but they are under a considerable strain when exposed to the reduced pressure above the surface. To go any higher, it produces all sorts of unwelcome effects on their tissues. An abrupt contour line, above which vegetation grows freely in many parts of the world, marks the limit of aquatic exploitation. Beyond this contour line live the land people, strange beings who neither nor understand nor tolerate the aquatics. There are the tree dwellers, of whom the aquatics know little. They keep to themselves in the branches above. Aquatics rarely look upwards, it is difficult for them to do so, and so these beings are rarely seen. Then there are the ground dwellers. Savage and hostile, they feed in the undergrowth and the long-growing vegetation, and the very materials the aquatics harvest. Gangs of them have been known to burst out of hiding and set themselves upon harvesting groups, tearing at the protective membranes with claws and teeth, and sometimes inflicting some damage. There's also the massive compound being, a huge, basic creature, bloated and misshapen, lumbering through the forest with four or five spindly little figures attached to it, embedded in it, seeming to live off its flesh. These beings cause no trouble. In fact, they sometimes blunder out into harvesting bodies where they are particularly vulnerable. In the open, they are easily brought down, and the moving reef of flesh can be killed by blows from an agile aquatic or or being drowned by being dragged within a membrane. The small attached creatures, tiny, wizened bodies with their spindly crab-like legs and enormous mouths, become strangely pathetic without their mount and scuttle clumsily for cover. There's good eating on the fat creature and is always borne back to the sea as a prize. Finally, there are the fighters, which are a menace, because they seem quite at home in the devastated areas left behind after harvesting. Their home is in the drier parts of the land masses, where little grows anyway. They are organized, and many dozens can attack at once, moving as a single entity of control by a single mind. Their forms are cruel cutting weapons that can slice through a living membrane with a blow and kill the aquatic inside. So this time, it is the aquatics who are the prey, and their wet, dead bodies are dragged away to the fighters' citadels. Of late, the attacks have been so organized that it is evidence the skirmishes are no longer defensive. Parties sally out with the firm intention of capturing and killing the harvesting aquatics. These beings must be left alone, and their domains avoided at any cost. The shapes prove to be trees after all, but the undergrowth beneath them is patchy, curled, and dead. Since the area down to the ocean has been devastated and left open to the sky, the air moving off the sea has swept in through the branches beneath the trunks, drying up and battering the fragile stems and tripling up the leaves. Loose sand and dust from the bare lands is gusted in, suffocating the more delicate types. There is little to be harvested here, but what is what there is must be taken. Gloob and his companions reach out their hands through the membranes and snatch up whatever is growing. Anything that is organic and contains proteins and carbohydrates can be used as the basis of food, however tough, however unpalatable. Bundles of leaves, stems, sticks, insects, slugs, anything, are caught up and passed into the sphere of the gathering aquatic.
small punctures in the membranes, like those caused when hands pass through, seal up immediately, and there is little to no moisture loss. Before long, the catch within the special miracle bubble has become quite large, large enough to take back. The five of them turn to make their laborious way back to their ocean home, glistening welcomingly on the horizon. No sooner have they left the shade of the dying trees and begun their slow descent than Gloom sees something at the periphery as a vision, something moving. Slowly he turns his head. Ground dwellers! A whole pack of them! They are running towards the aquatics, waving sticks of some kind. His companions see the danger at the same time and try to move more quickly. However, their laborious humping motion is not conducive up to haste. And anyway, they cannot move faster than the spherical bubble containing their harvest. The only reason they are here in this hostile environment in the first place. The ground dwellers quickly surround them, and as their hazy shapes appear before them, Gloob notices something different about them. They are each carrying something, something like a blade at the end of a stick. Gloob has not much time to notice anything else, as he ducks out of the way to avoid them, but after heaving himself along the ground for some distance, he turns back. The ground dwellers are set up, have all set upon one of his companions. They have plunged their weapons into his membrane and are pulling it apart. With two creatures pulling in different directions, this turns out to be very easy, and the membrane collapses in a gush of water, leaving the stranded aquatic gasping in a circle of wet mud. Gloob and the others crawl frantically away, toward the tempting but distant sea, panic rising within them, for with good reason, for the party of ground dwellers leave the dying aquatic and come running after the straggler of the group and fling themselves upon him. Gloob does not stay to watch this time, but keeps wriggling. With every jump and jerk, he expects to be attacked from behind, and his membrane torn away from him. The waves of the ocean come closer and closer, but agonizingly slowly. Will he make it before they catch them? He tries not to think about it and keeps going. With an intense feeling of joy, he feels the pressure of the first wave closing around him. He is safe, and at last he can look around. The bubble, with one of his companions and the gathered food, has reached the sea. The food is also safe. But what, what cost? Three companions are lost, punctured, dehydrated, and slaughtered on the distant, dusty dryness. The ground dwellers have never fought like this before. Perhaps the aquatic harvesting has had such an effect on their life cell that they have had to adopt these extreme measures to fight back. Maybe the conflict and strife have forced them to find new ways of living and organizing themselves just to survive. Gloob's alcohol envelope dissipates now that he is fully submerged, and with graceful movements he descends the sloping seabed until he has a push and pull of the waves and home. Now he has time to ponder. Is his organization and use of weapons by the ground dwellers to be a feature of all such attacks in the future? Has the aquatic exploitation of the land made even that more hazardous? Is there nothing that they can do to feed their people without making things worse and worse and destroying everything that they have? Is this to be the continuing fate of intelligent life above and below the water? The food will be there and can be taken as the travelers know. Every year the enclosures ripen, the planters awake, feed, repair the enclosures if necessary, plant the new seed, and return to their slumbers once more. The secret is for the travelers to time the journey so as to arrive before the planters rouse from their long sleep. The planters are supposed to be a very ancient race, and each one of them lives for many hundreds of years, if live is the right word. How can you be living if more than nine tenths of your life is spent asleep? How did this come about? It probably goes back to the time when the differences between the cold times and warm times were much greater than they are now. There have always been animals that hibernated, slowed around their systems, and gone to sleep during the coldest time of the year. These creatures usually gather their food and store it, waking up and eating from time to time. Or else they eat so much when they are awake, they build up stores of fat that nourish them while they sleep. The planters were once normal, like the travelers, but probably not so intelligent. Back when the ice had just shriveled up from the continents and the winters were still cold, they developed the ability to sleep away the harvest of the conditions, and they, they stored up food as well. Some of the seeds and grains that they store would have germinated by the time the spores were open, or then if the hibernation time were long enough, they may even fruit it again. As the centuries and millennia passed, the planters developed their ability to remain suspended until harvest time, when they would come out and eat to plant the next crop and retire again. Travelers know that it was possible for such things to happen, vaguely remember the knowledge that their ancestors possessed, knowledge about changing conditions and changing life. There must never be any dealings with the planters. The planters build their enclosures and use the growing vegetation not just for food. They gather their food from where it grows, but also plant it in places that will be more convenient to collect from. They build walls and roofs of stone and wood to protect what they have done, just as their remote ancestors did. It was the beginning of the changes that eventually destroyed everything, the land, the living things, themselves. Now nothing must be altered, nothing must be built, nothing must be changed from its natural state. That is the credo of the travelers. It is a sign of their strength that they know how to make their life easier, but ignore the knowledge. Any one of them has 
enough inherited knowledge to dig the burning stones or the naturally distilled organic fluid from the ground, if indeed there are any of these deposits left, and use their heat to melt down the metal minerals. They could all break down the substances from the rocks and use them for many varied purposes. They know that it is possible to fly to the moon and stars, and they know how to do it, but they will not. They will not call down destruction once more. It is not just their memories that impress this credo upon them. Wherever they travel, through the lush forests and woodlands, or across the open plains and deserts, they see the dismal results. In a forested valley where they remember once stood a city, the rocks that outcrop on the slopes of the stream gullies are not natural. They are man-made, sometimes with unnatural angles and faces that have miraculously survived two million years of burial. The soil here is stained and streaked with red and green, where vast volumes of metal that went into the artifacts have oxidized their way to dust. The area is disgustingly unnatural and avoided. Elsewhere lie similar remains that are lethal to any creature that passes close by. Even now, two million years later, the technological overproduction of their ancestors has the power to kill. Nothing here is at the surface here, but not far down lies the disintegrated ruin of some vast structure, so great to have been the natural forces of erosion and decay that nothing recognizable of the original structure even remains even underground, but some of the raw materials still lie there, emitting a deadly force. Anyone crossing this area sickens and die. The travelers remember that it was something to do with the generation of energy. That is why the travelers despise the dark-minded creatures, their distant relatives, with whom they share the planet but who did not have remembered knowledge. These beings, such as the planters, constantly use their minds and their hands to devise and construct artifacts. They are intelligent enough to think out new ways of doing things, although they, were, they did not remember that these things had been done before. It is as if the whole disease is starting all over again. Dig a shelter today, build a house tomorrow, clear a forest for a city the day after, choke the landscape with the waste minerals the next, plant a seed today, cut down a clearing for many seeds tomorrow, deforest and irrigate a valley the day after, change the global climate, make a spade today, make a spear tomorrow, make an explosive machine the next day, engulf the plane with instantaneous fire and leave it a poisonous ruin the next. Although the travelers make it their work to frustrate any of this activity whenever they find it, they also use its results. In the far north where they go when times are war, they eat the food grown in the enclosures by the planters. In the far south, they have traveled there along the spines and ridges of the high ground between the foul line and slime lands. They eat the roots and tubers stored on the cold chambers of the hivers. It is a paradox they do not even try to solve. They are, after all, human beings. Things are set to change, however. It was not just the making of things and the deliberate changing of the planet that killed their ancestors. The planet itself undergoes changes from time to time, and these changes were such that their ancestors could not withstand them. A force within the Earth that allowed them to tell which was north and which was south died away and then reversed. That was one of the factors. The same force is used by the travelers themselves. Something, some sense inside them, allows them to detect and follow it. Over the past few generations, however, it has been fading away again, and now travel between feeding grounds is going to become increasingly difficult. The traveling party of fifteen contemplate this. They sit in the cave mouth, watching the rain hurtling down, stirring up the smells of the forest. This cave, in fact this whole hillside, is unfamiliar to the party. They've never passed it in previous years, so they must have gone a well off course. It should not be too much of a problem. Once the sky is clear, they can take the direction from the sun and the stars. If the sky is clear. Night is falling and the wet grayness is becoming darker. They're going to have to spend the night here, but at least they have the shelter of the rocky overhang. When morning comes, there are only twelve of them. During the night, something has come out of the cave and taken away the other three, something that their communal memory has not anticipated, something with small, human-like feet that left damp prints on the rocks. The survivors move on. The skies are not clear, but they would rather make a guess about which way to go than stay in this place. The Seeker is a tiny, wizened object, a degenerate fragment of its ancestor. It has no need of legs, since it is carried everywhere, and so it has none. It has no needs of arms, since everything is done for it, and so its arms and hands are atrophied. It needs neither eyes nor ears, since the only sense it uses is deep down within its head. It has no external organ, so its eyes and ears are sunken and shriveled. It's merely a head with a nose and a mouth, and a little body. It nestles within the hands of the, of the bearer, a sterile adult female that has been turned away from life as a nurse and potential queen, deep within the hive and kept at the surface as part of the foraging bands. The adult males, the warriors, have changed a little in outward appearance since the hive communities first evolved. If anything, their legs have become longer, enabling them to cross open spaces more quickly and forage over large areas. Their bodies have become smaller, and they have now lost their pot-bellied appearance, since the warriors hardly ever eat grass now, and have little need for the, of the volume voluminous intestinal bacteria that's of their ancestors. The cellulose cracking enzymes produced by the engineered pancreatic gland is still being produced, but not in such quantities as previously. The eye coverings are dark, shielded from the harsh glare of the sun, and protected against the stinging sand by heavy lids. 
The nose is bulbous, the internal passages winding between bony panels covered with a damp membrane that moistens and cools the harsh desert air long before it reaches the lungs. A bushy mustache around the nostrils and across the upper lip filters the grit and dust from the breathed air. A smooth hump of fat over the shoulders and neck is established in the wet and abundant season, but this tends to shrivel up, up when the climates become dry. It is mostly in their behavior that they differ from their ancestors. Now they have no individuality at all, listening for the few grunts of command from their leader and obeying blindly. It is not in the interest of the hive as a whole for anyone to show any individuality. And so it was lost generations upon generations ago. Now and again, however, it surfaces once more, and under the influence of these throwbacks, hives begin to experiment with new ways, new and different ways of living, which nearly always end in failure. The progressive hive dies, turns to dust, and the neighboring hives absorb its territory. As always, the youngsters, male and female, make up the gathering parties, using their big hands to dig in the soil and carry the food that they find. When they come of age, the males develop into warriors and may eventually become breeders. The females become nurses with the possibility of becoming queens someday, or else they become bearers entrusted with the task of satisfying every need of the all-important seekers. This day is much like any other. The party of gatherers, guided by the seeker and guarded by the warriors, sets out from the hive in the pre-dawn, the coolest time of day, and best for travel. Behind them, a silhouette against the lightning sky, lies the bulk of the hive. Its flat roofs jut out like natural rock formations to produce the shade and the heat of the day. The vertical walls beneath the overhangs form banks of variously sized openings for access and ventilation, and its many chimneys and breathing funnels point up like fingers and arches along the sky. Deep below is the maze of passages and chambers dedicated to the housing and comfort of the queen and her young offspring. Here lies the food storage units, co cooled by the constant circulation and evaporation of water from the moist walls. The dampened air has been carried around the hive through the living quarters by an ingenious network of finely fashioned holes and tunnels, driven by the natural movement of the wind across external vents. The vapor is eventually recondensed to liquid before the stale air is lost to the outer atmosphere. The water for all this is brought up from from the deep walls and water pits by capillary action through the rocks. The party, 100 strong, takes its usual route along the undulating foothills, skirting the dreadful lime lands on the right and the berry rock and uplands on the left. Beyond, the slope widens out into a valley in which water flows for much of the year and where plants can grow and there are usually tubers or thick roots to be had. Before their narrow path widens, the leader of the group Oop, the party orders and halt. The seeker is agitated, but it is not telling them that there is food close by, it is telling them that others approach. With another grunt, the leader calls the warriors together in a protective wall, but they not have worried. Those who approach pose no threat. It is full day now, and the party can see five or six shambling creatures moving down the rocky slope towards the slime land. Their bodies are very bulky, very bulky for the size of their legs, with thick hummocks and rolls of fat seeming to engulf them. Dull faces look out from the folds and the pale flesh. In the dim light, however, the parasites are just visible, tiny and spider-like. Four or five of them are embedded in the deep fat of each figure, their buried faces unseen, feeding continuously from the creature's surplus. No threat to the hive, and so of no interest to the party, but the leader does recollect that more and more of them are seen nowadays, wandering over their domain. They seem to be spreading from the forest areas that are their home. Dimly, the leader wonders what they find to eat here, and how they protect themselves from the harsh sun. It is not wonderful long, however. With a backhanded gesture, he brushes the first of the day's sand out of his mustache and signals for the party to move onwards. Soon he has the party on the move once more, and the strangers have been completely forgotten. Had the party stayed to watch, they would have absorbed the lumbering creatures scrambled down into the flats of the slime lands and weighed out amongst the disgusting blue-green sogginess. Dumbly, they scoop up handfuls of the slime, exposing the yellow stench beneath, and begin to feed on it. The parasites embedded in their fat ignore all this. The food, be it nuts, leaves, or slime, will be converted into deposits, into huge deposits of fat and tissue that will sustain them. The parasites and their hosts are not the first communal creature to arrive since the days of the engineers, but they are the only surviving type. The symbionts, in which the hunters teamed up with the tundra dwellers who live on the cold plains, are extinct now. They took to the mountains after the cold plains faded away, and there they existed for some time, but they were never really developed as mountain creatures, and all kinds of maladaptations began to show themselves. Eventually, the populations dwindled and the whole race died out. This is not a case amongst the parasites and their hosts. Their hosts, too, are descended from the tundra dwellers, but unlike the carriers of the symbionts, they change as the conditions change. Gone are the woolly coats and the resistance to extreme cold, but they still retain the thick deposits of fat. Indeed, their metabolism generates more fat than they could possibly need, and this is what sustains the parasites. The energy and raw materials for all this production comes from the constant consumption of plants, any kinds of plants, including the blue-green algal currents that the aquatics developed as their own food source and spread over the lowland areas of the globe, turning them into the foul slime lands just so despised most of the land-living creatures. 
It is not only the hybrids that ignore the parasites and their hosts they wade into the featureless slippery mat. Also ignoring them are the aquatics, not far away, loping and slithering around in the moist yellow depths beneath the slime crust. They are grazing their way through the algal culture their ancestors established aeons ago oh, on the lowlands above the surface of the ocean. There's plenty of food for them now, not like in the days of want. They, are known, they know very well that some creatures from the land come over and steal from the edges, but the losses are small. The only trouble is dehydration. If the algal cover is breached, there may be a considerable water loss before it has a chance to grow again. With all the world's lowlands covered in self-sustaining food generator, there's little to worry about.